and make them their collaborators. Though many of those people will resist them and betray them. That's why it's important to understand the history because it's not a, a, a one look. You know? Right. You have to really see the intricacies of resistance and rebellion and death. It's just like most people come to North America and say, well, y'all never really freed yourself. Well, you never looked at our history to say that. There's, there's right. recorded at least 300 plus African rebellions that was of significance in the United States, North America. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the Civil War, over 300,000 of us fought in uniform with another four to 500,000 out of uniform behind the line, being workers, being supporters, being the people who carry the equipment. So nearly a half a million plus of us is fighting in the Civil War to destroy the Confederacy. Both from the exactly. south. That's the war of liberation on our part. Exactly. We, we fought to free ourselves. It, it right. wasn't given. Right. It wasn't it Abraham was Lincoln. We fought to free ourselves. And we killed millions of white people, okay? So y'all need right. to stop it and really see what <laughs> happened here. And if you go back down to the British, we fought with the British who said, we're going to give you freedom. In the North, we fought with the British in the South. And the British, the people who fought with the North, you know, they end up in Nova Scotia and then Sierra Leone. Nobody ever asked where the largest part of that black population went who was in the South. Because the largest part of the black population fighting against uh, America was not in the North. And you know where that population went? To Jamaica and to Trinidad. Okay. And they started the Poco Man movement in Jamaica. Those black Geechee Gala people who fought with the British. And in right. Trinidad, Tony Martin deals with this in his book, his last book, God Bless His Beautiful Soul, uh, History mm -hmm. of the Caribbean. He deals with the population that went to Trinidad, and I went to that community. And the streets are named after different military companies they fought in for the British. And when it was, right. you know, so don't tell me if you don't know history, you say we accepted this. But if you know history, this idea a week went by when some black folks wasn't rebelling in North America. Well, the same and, thing and, went on in, in Africa. It would right. they go by where somebody wasn't killing an enemy, escaping from slavery leading an army against the enslavers, putting up defense against enslavement, and that's all across the continent of Africa. And, and, and here in the United States, especially other ways that we rebelled uh, against slavery, uh, learning to read and write was a way of rebelling against slavery. Mm -hmm. And one of the things many of us did when we learned to read and write, we, we wrote our own freedom papers and ran away also. Because oftentimes the, uh, the slave patrollers, a lot of them were illiterate. That mm -hmm. patrol the roads, right. things like that. So you, you so you can give them with a, a stamp paper. on, and it was good to go. <laughs> yep, you can say this, this is your but, freedom but, paper. But, but uh, you the had resistance movement in Africa was extraordinary mm -hmm. because Africans didn't view human beings as commodity. That's culturally right. out of sync. Our okay. world view right. didn't work like that. That's right. you can't view Africa through European lenses. Otherwise, exactly. you're not going to even That's understand. True. That's what true, resistance yeah. is. You know, to, to take a human being's name from them, mm -hmm. that's tantamount to slitting somebody's throat. Right. You don't, you don't take a human being's name. Your name is your ancestral lineage tag. Takes you back to God. Right. You know? And so if you just look at the African concept of being human, it didn't allow for chattel slavery to be a part of their consciousness. And even mm -hmm. those who got involved in that, that selling people as commodity, like for that period in Dahomey and that period in Ashanti and maybe some other places as well, one thing you will see for sure, they knew nothing about chattel slavery. They had not right. been on a ship coming to America. Not a single one of them owned the slave ship. All right? They didn't control the armies that was controlling the shores of Africa. These were all white foreigners with guns. They didn't own a single plantation in America or the Caribbean or Central South America. So let's stop giving ourselves excuses for why we can't look in the mirror and love ourselves. Because right. what a lot of, let me tell you what a lot of this is. This mm -hmm. resistance is self-hate. Correct. And, Correct. And, and, and someone is trying to say, stop hating yourself. But hating me felt so good. So it's hard to stop. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, um, and I'm saying, stop hating yourself.
take this tool. No, this movie is not perfect. It's not a panacea. It's not going to solve all of our problems about the slave trade or history. But guess what? You watch movies all the time and you enjoy them. And most of them are nonsensical. Uh, most of them disrespectful to black people, um, mm -hmm. disrespectful to things African and our spiritual system. And you enjoy them. This one fight to be the opposite of all of that. Go in and enjoy it. I guarantee you, you'll come back and call Brother Michael. So Brother Michael, thank you, brother. <laughs> thank you, brother. Because I saw some Black uh, technicians and some Black directors and some Black actors and actresses, and they put on a beautiful, fictitious performance inspired by the history of our people, about our mm -hmm. women, who were extraordinary work. And see, the thing is, these women were considered by the whole world that found out about them to be the most extraordinary of extraordinaries. Right. It ain't that they didn't exist. They exist. Mm -hmm. And and the little piece of them that we see in this film that talk about their principles, their integrity, their dignity, their training, their devotion, their loyalty to their nation and their king, that's just a tiny bit. Right. who they really were. Right. Because if, right. We, if we did not have these women, we would not have the woman who raised Jean-Jacques Dessaline, who was one of these women in Haiti mm -hmm. to give us the Haitian Revolution victory. Yes. One of these women yes. from the Dahomey Army who raised Jean-Jacques Dessaline. And my right. sister... Um, as a Danto is trying to get a piece out here, it, she's calling it the Dadas. It's about some of okay. these women. Yeah, I know, I know her. And yeah, Danto, I know Haiti. her. Yeah, mm -hmm. she's an extraordinary sister. Um, mm -hmm. the Free Haiti movement is is what she's she's ahead of, and and these women, many of whom was a part of that fighting force, who've now been captured and sold into Haiti by the French. They've not gotten old, broken down, can't have sex no more. They can't be abused no more. They can't work in the field no more. So the Catholic Church takes them according to as they done so. These ladies, they call the dadad. And they <coughs> put them in a church lay organization to convert other young African enslaved women to Catholicism. But instead, mm -hmm. these very ladies, these former warriors, train the leadership that become the women leadership in the Haitian revolution. Right. And many of the women they train marry the very generals we see as the heroes in the Haitian revolution. This thing is bigger than you think it is, brothers and sisters. <laughs> exactly. Than you think it is. Um, right. So if this movie does nothing else but make you pick up a book, grab a DVD mm -hmm. and start studying, listening to a, a, a Brother Carver, Dr. Jeffrey, yep. Dr. Clark, Dr. Jacob yep. Rutgers, Dr. Asa Hilliard, Dr. You know, right. Amos Wilson, um, going back to yep. your brother in England with Wendy Rule. Um, oh, Robin Walker. Robin yeah, Walker. I got his book right behind me, yeah. Robin Walker. And, and because Brilliant you brother. see that we have an extraordinary history. We did not give up. Otherwise, right. we would still be in slavery. Right. We fought every single day from one end of Africa to the other, from one end of the Caribbean to the other, from one end of Central South America to the other, from one end of North America to the other. And we've mm -hmm. transformed the white world. And what's so right. beautiful about Viola and her husband and that beautiful director and the others, they took the content and white intent and transformed white content to an African intent that made sense. They interpreted it in a way that they took the, the, the intent of someone else's content, content being the writing that was done. And right. all content has intent. Right. And so I'm just assuming given history what the intent might have been, even if it wasn't deliberate, just culturally. And mm -hmm. I know these black folks took that content and redirected that intent to give us a cinematic document that I think is rather extraordinary. 
Okay, we're going to come back to that point in just a second. I want to go to this uh, clip here. This is an excerpt of the interview that Viola Davis did on Good Morning America because this gets deeper into it. And she talks more about making the film. Before that, we, we don't want to forget the sisters. We mentioned a number, a number of brothers that are scholars. So Sister Nubia uh, Wartford from here in Detroit, Nubia Marinke, she's watching as well. She just saw the movie. You know Sister Nubia. Mm -hmm. She just saw the movie. She had extraordinary production. But also sisters like uh, ancestors like Dr. Francis Cress Wilson, and Dr. Um, uh, 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 Patri uh, Patricia uh, Newton. Uh, you've got, um, we have uh, Dr. Marimba Ani, okay, who wrote Urugu, an African Centered Critique of European Cultural Thought and Behavior. We have um, uh, Sister uh, Teaches the Meta Netter. I know her. Um, uh, um, uh, it'll come to me. Uh, um, Raketi. Dr. Oh, Ricchetti, I'm in. Yes. Yeah, Dr. Ricchetti, I'm in. So we, so we have the sisters also, uh, Talita, uh, Dr. Uh, Talita uh, LaFloria, uh, whose book is behind me, Dr. Dany uh, Ramey Berry, uh, Dr. Erica Armstrong Dunbar. So we have the sisters also. Oh, yeah. Okay, uh, uh, those watching, uh, uh, those watching, if, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. And also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Uh, this helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. Uh, and visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. We have the information there and uh, my online classes. You can support us there also. How can people support you, uh, Professor Small? Well, always. Um, dollar sign, catch up, Dr. Dan Small. Okay, I'm going to put that up here also. Yeah, but uh, sister, well, you're going to say something. Go ahead. Yeah, Sister Nubia. And how you doing, my beautiful sister, who's a heck of a historian. Yes. Palms of archaeology, doing research in Sudan, but the rest of us are even scared to go. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And she said it is correct that only 4% of Africans across the continent were involved in the slave trade versus 96% Arab and European. And people need to know that. So if you right. think that 4% is big, just look at how much, what percentage of the black community sell drugs in the black community, right? To you every day, that's, <laughs> that's worse than any kind of slave trade. So yes, you right. will have people who are weak. Yes, you will have people who will fall. But let's not talk about the weak. Let's talk about the strong. And what this movie show is what a strong African woman looked like. Miss Viola, yes. girl, every step you took in this movie made the earth think, <laughs> okay? Um, <laughs> And the young lady, who's the young lady that played her daughter? Uh, Mbedu uh, Thesu, I think is her name. She's from South Africa. Uh -huh. She's from South Africa, yes. She was brilliant. Um, mm -hmm. And the sister who played her big sister who died and in, in saving her life, she was right. brilliant with the, the way she brought this con sisterhood concept, motherhood concept of adopting the orphan bringing you into right. the family, taking care of you now. Uh, that piece that I grew up in on the plantation in South Carolina, that Africa, with so many of us grew up in, in Mississippi and Alabama and Arkansas and Louisiana and, and Texas. Dude, let's, stop, yeah, dude. let's stop forgetting. Because we brought Africa right here with us and we behaved in a certain way. What made you think we right. behaved any differently at home? Right, exactly. Let's exactly. Stop it was Thusu and Beidou. She played uh, Beidou. Nawi, yeah. uh, the, the uh, yeah. Viola Davis's Beidou. daughter. Uh, give us your cash app again, so I can put it up here, uh, Professor Small. What's your cash app again? Um, cash um, dollar sign. Doctor James Small. Okay, uh, Dr. James Small. Uh -huh. Okay, okay, we'll put that up here, so you all can support uh, Professor Small also. Okay. Uh, I want to go to, uh, I want to play a little excerpt of this, uh, interview. Interview, yeah, uh, interview, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Viola Davis was on good morning America on September 13th, 2022. And, uh, let's go to this clip here. A movement. This is so much more mm -hmm. than just a movie. And you yes. even talked about it being yes. so, so important to you. And just that, that Zenith for you, that sort of magnum opus, yes. I call it. Yeah. I think the same reaction that you have as an audience is the reason why I did the movie. First of all, it is a movie that's led by women. And it's a movie that's led by black women. And it's a movie that's led by dark-skinned black women. There is no white savior. 
you know, and it's women who are warriors tapping into not only their physical strength, but also when you see the movie, they're humanized. And so, when have you seen that? I remember someone online said, I'm tired of seeing dark skinned black women is just just strong and fighting and masculine. And I was like, when have you ever seen that? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, really. Yeah. You feel me? <laughs> we do now. We do now. And yes. what a cast you've put together to tell this story. Absolutely. Tuso Bedu, Lashana Lynch, <laughs> Sheila Atim, you know, Adrian Warren, who was in Tina mm -hmm. Turner, you know, um, as well as Sia, Shioma, Jamie Lawson, women who are beyond brilliant, but also, I mean, women who are playing roles of our goji warriors mm. that literally, it could have been an action film, mm. but when they walk in, you see people, mm. you see humans, and I think that's what shifts. You bring out the best in people because the critics are saying this cast, everyone mm -hmm. in every single role, the best. Yes, absolutely, and you know, Here's the thing, you know, as a woman, you're taught that being a girl and being feminine is not about tapping into your physical strength. It's about being demure, speaking in a high voice, being polite all the time. Whereas the challenge of the reason why I loved it so much is my body served me. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it was, I had to do five hours of weightlifting <laughs> and martial arts every day. Is that all new for you? Wait a minute, you did You did weightlifting, you did sprinting, you did weapons training, but you also you have to take a DNA test. DNA test, which I didn't want to see. <laughs> I didn't want to see I'm um, lactose intolerant. I have a high rate of injury. I said I can't eat sugar. I mean, and I had to keep telling Gina Prince Bythewood, great, great director. I had to keep calling her and say, Gina, Gina, listen, listen to me now. You know I'm 56. You know if I get on that treadmill at 9.4, I lose oxygen. <laughs> I could die of a heart attack, Gina. These girls are 30 years old. Gina, you got to do something else. You got to do something else. You're going to have a dead warrior here. Dead warrior. <laughs> Let's give everybody a look. All right. Your family? No wonder. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's an excerpt of a great interview. Uh, that uh, Viola Davis did uh, on Good Morning America. That's on the Good Morning America's YouTube channel. Uh, that's from September 13th, 2022. Okay, uh, any any comments on that uh, before I, I go to the uh, next uh, uh, topic? No, I think she, she said it all. I mean, this yes. is black <laughs> women having an opportunity to interpret mm -hmm. their racial history and at the same time to interpret the role that black women have played in history, are playing in history and could play in history. Um, right. You know, when we look at the civil rights movement in America, from top to bottom, there's that black woman. You know, exactly. um, when Marcus Garvey goes to prison, he leaves Henrietta Benton Davis in charge of UNI, and that's some brother. When Malcolm mm -hmm. X goes overseas, he leaves the woman in charge of OAU. When right. Malcolm X died, his sister Ella becomes the president of OAU. Um, when the youth was trained to do the bus rides in the South, these were black women who organized that bus ride into the South and trained them into nonviolent tactics. You know, um, whether you ever look at civil rights leaders marching with Dr. King and others, you see all those black women right there marching. You see Sister Fannie Lou Hamer in Mississippi, the most terrorist state in America at the time, who had been abused mm -hmm. and raped in prison and beaten in all kinds right. of ways. She was sterilized and also. On, yep. You know, mm -hmm. and forcing the Democratic Party convention to come to a halt. Nothing like yes. that had ever happened in the history of America at the convention yes. in Jersey. This black woman had been fierce throughout our history. She mm -hmm. is our mother. And any foolish man would get caught up in some white dialectic foolishness and not understand right. your mama, your wife, your daughter, your sister, 
and you're caught up in some female demeaning, uh, minimizing process, you know something's wrong with you. So go on and fix yourself. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Um, so before before I played that clip, you were talking about the difference between the content and the intent. Right. The content and the intent. Talk, talk about that because you, you we discussed that earlier today, and you're yes, talking sir. about the the two white female writers, Maria right. uh, Bello and the other one, uh, yes. their intent, and then what uh, Viola Davis and her husband Julius Tennant were able to do. Talk mm -hmm. about that, please. Right. I haven't worked on a film. I've seen some of the best writers who are well-meaning people who have done good research and they're trying to write a black story, but they don't okay. come from our culture. They don't come okay. from our value system. They so these have, are not African-Americans, these maybe white view. other ethnic groups. Right. They, just, just to be clear, okay. Right. right, they don't have our worldview. Right. And they're trying to tell the story. And what they end up writing is their content about us. But that content <laughs> comes with an intent based on their value system and their worldview. And so I could see where Ms. Davis and her husband would have to look at that content, analyze its intent, and then use the, con the, the Black, the knowledge of being an African to take that content and alter its intent, you see? And the right. way we see the design um and you know i can be critical michael because when we first started yes i'd get ready to beat up on sister viola and right fact, <laughs> i had me bags brother small you need to go watch it brother small and i watched yep. it and i, I told him, professor kaba i told professor kaba the same thing yeah. professor kaba yeah. i want to come in there i told him the same I thing the work and i know what they had to go to to accomplish the work i know right. our history because like you I, i'm wrapped in history that's my thing I am history, right. you know, and right. I know the culture. Like if you look over my shoulder, you see Shango, the big guy standing there with all of my electors around his neck. Next to mm -hmm. Shango is my mother, Oya. Above Oya is the is the head of the Benin uh, prince that the European captured and don't want to give us back that head. Sitting at the bottom is the Ashanti um, god because I go nowhere without them. I immerse myself in the philosophy that surrounds them. And so, like Viola was talking about how she had to get in shape and be to do this movie, because you could see it was very challenging physically. Um, right. But you could see them meeting the challenge. And African culture, when, when you're trying to take the, the content written, even by Africans themselves, because you gotta remember, colonization and slavery have altered our consciousness to such a degree right. that much of our content have the wrong intent because of value system and worldview. And if you wanna bring a message to really talk about taking content and creating an intent that will bring a message that will show even in fiction, the possibility of what the history of a people could have been and should have been. They had a job cut out for them and they met the challenge. Yes. They met the yeah, challenge. Yeah, I definitely agree. I definitely agree with that. Um people talk of one of the things that uh, uh I see on social media and in the media in general. And also this came up. So this is this movie comes out right around this right after Queen Elizabeth II dies. And then a lot of information comes out with the uh, British involvement in not just the transatlantic slave trade, but in colonizing a uh, little more than 25 percent of the world population. Mm -hmm. OK, um, so so some people say things like, well, um, the British abolished the international transatlantic slave trade in 1807 and uh, uh, Dahomey uh, didn't want to abolish it or um, the British did the right thing or they, they try to make the British out to be saints or something like that. It's like, wait a second, they got involved in 1562. OK, <laughs> and, 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 and they didn't. And in 1807, uh, when they when they passed the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the Slavery Abolition Act. 
uh, that just dealt with bringing Africans into their British colonies. It was still legal to have slavery in the British colonies. They didn't yeah. end that to 1834. Yeah, they didn't end okay, slavery. Talk about that. Right. Yes. The British did not end slavery. Mm -hmm. What the British did was to interrupt the competition. Slavery okay. produced for Britain the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. But now Correct. those who had free labor was challenging the wealth of the Industrial Revolution. So Britain mm -hmm. replaced its labor population with the Irish and the Scots who they were occupying, who had they, they had colonized in the British Isles. People don't even go back there. The Irish <laughs> right. and the Scots, this was their land. British people, people we call British people, these are Germans, Anglo and Saxons who invaded Anglos and these Saxons. people. All right. Right. And so now they realize in order to make the money, they were they had already made all the money that all of the wealth that undergirds the Industrial Revolution in Britain comes from the transatlantic slave trade. All of them. Right. They had no wealth right. before that of any significance. OK. Right. And so now they had that wealth. They wanted to move in another direction in terms of wealth building and wealth creation. But that was being challenged by these other states who was getting the wealth from slavery, from the slave trade. So France, who was a competition, Denmark, who was a competition, Spain, a competition, Pope, um, Portugal and Germany, Britain had to find a way to minimize their ability to use wealth from the transatlantic slave trade to challenge British hegemony over the burgeoning Industrial Revolution. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? Yes. You get it. Okay. Yes. So they trade chattel slavery for wage slavery mm -hmm. on the Irish and, and the Scots. In, in and the Irish and the Scots. And then at the same time, they want to minimize the French developing their industrialization, minimize the Portuguese and the Spanish developing their industrialization. But to do that, you've got to then do what they went, went out there with ships and said, and they only have three ships out there. Three ships that can patrol the whole Atlantic Ocean, give me a break, okay? Mm -hmm. So they, they went out there with ships and said, we're going to block you from trading, making money <laughs> off the slave trade, because that's going to make right. you wealthy enough to compete with us in this new industrial pro direction we are going in. And we're going to say we're doing something for humanity. But at the meantime, they still got people <laughs> enslaved, not just in Britain itself, but in all the British right. colonies around the world. Well, now, now we're going to take it a step further, and then, then I want to just show briefly some information dealing with the Industrial Revolution, because I do a whole presentation dealing with the uh, the uh, African American uh, origins or African American roots of uh, Labor Day history, and um, this goes back into the origins of the Industrial Revolution, starting in the 1790s in Manchester, England, and a lot of the cotton that was being produced at that time was produced by African slave labor. Mm -hmm. So. When, when we look at it, people can read this article here. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but read this article. It's a fact check. It's from USA Today. I've talked about it before in the African History Network show. This deals with um, uh, United Kingdom finished paying off debts to slave owning families in 2015, which they did. They had to take out a loan to pay. Now, what happened was when they abolished, um, uh, finally abolished slavery in 1834 in their colonies, uh, Britain pays um 46,000 British slave owners they paid them reparations it's about 19 million pounds i don't know what that translates to in dollars it was about 19 million pounds okay and then they take out a loan to um uh pay to pay them they just finished really paying off that loan and the interest things like that in 2015 but uh this section here in the article in total about 3.5 million uh african people were transported to british colonies across the americas and caribbean Though only 2.75 million survived the harrowing middle passage in the confines of slave ships across the ocean. So you you would think the, the way a lot of this stuff is floating around, Professor Small, you would think it was Dahomey that sold 3.1 million Africans. Right. It, the, 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 the British get they, they get left off the hook. They get let off the hook. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that's why it's important for people to go watch this movie because yes. Dahomey is simply prototypical of African resistance, the movie. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. could have happened anywhere in Africa because it did happen everywhere in Africa. Right. Let me say it again. 
this could have happened anywhere in Africa because this type of resistance happened everywhere in Africa. You know? Yes, the resistance um, happened everywhere in yeah. Africa, and, and then also a lot of a lot of African uh, ethnic groups, nations were given an ultimatum by Europeans: either you provide us with African captives, or we're going to take you also. Because the Europeans are coming with the them, they had a military presence station on the shore. That's what slave right. dungeons were. State slave dungeons were forts that housed right. their military with their cannons right. and their armament that they could come up with on any given day and wipe you out, which they did on many occasions. Right. So let's study the thing and understand it. I want my yes. brothers and sisters, especially African Americans. Stop being cowards about learning your history. Don't come tell mm -hmm. me about the baseball game, the football game, and the basketball game, and who's got a girlfriend, who's got a boyfriend, what's this one stand, and what's this? And, and none of that takes any money home to your pocket. None of that right. transforms your consciousness and allows you to be a better person so you can raise your children in a safer world. History does that for you. History exactly. gives you a worldview. History gives you a perspective on your daily reality. History tells you who your friends and enemy has been and who your friends and enemies are today. Instead of you right. looking at yourself and hating yourself, you know, hate the person that destroyed the image of yourself while you're restoring right. that image to yourself. And this takes study, but you don't have to study hard. I've got at least mm -hmm. 100 tapes on, on, on YouTube. Just go listen right. to Brother Small. Ain't gonna cost you nothing. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Go to the right. M Hotep's education channel. Tune into his mm -hmm. classes. Tune into Baba yes. Kaba's classes. Um, tune into Dr. Ma'at. You know, yeah. See will blow you away. You know, right. and you realize that people say, Well, where do I go to get the history? Just turn on your computer. <laughs> you don't have to turn on your computer. Turn on your cell phone. All of us are going right. over your cell phone. Okay. Well, this is this is one of the reasons why I created the African History Network in 2010 to provide that uh, information. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, very quickly here, and then we're going to wrap up. And I, I want you to let people know. Uh, I want you to give people your website and tell people about your courses coming up, anything like that as well. Mm -hmm. But very quickly, we talked about the Industrial Revolution. Now, this comes from the BBC. This is part of my presentation that I do dealing with the origins of uh, the Labor Day holiday. Mm -hmm. uh, this is from BBC.co.uk, and you know they have. They have a lot of documentation uh, on all this, uh, the BBC. Um, uh, slave trade and the British economy. Uh, British profits were made from exporting manufacturing goods to Africa and importing products uh, of enslaved labor such as sugar. Uh, ports such as Glasgow, Bristol, and Liverpool, Liverpool, England, where the, Brit where the Beatles were from, mm -hmm. uh, and Liverpool prospered as a result of the slave trade. So they go through and they have um, all these charts and things like this. But there's a there's a portion here uh, dealing with cotton that I just want to focus in on. Um, and I want to see if I can get to this. Okay, they talk about this. I can't. I can't. Let me see which page is this on. Uh, they have these slides here. Which one is this? Okay, this is three. Uh, the role of the role of the trade in navigation. And okay, this deals with manufacturing. Uh, so this one right here shows um, uh, economic growth and the Industrial Re Revolution. Many historians describe the Industrial Revolution as a process rather than as an event. The, uh, the part that exports played can be shown as a virtuous circle. So exports uh, grow, industry grows, business owners invest and look for better machines. Machines get better, products get cheaper exports grow you, you have this cycle they, were, they okay. were trying to corner the mark when they did this thing of mm -hmm. blockading the slave trade because yes. they were trying to corner the market and the industrial revolution development and did not want the competition from the french the germans the spanish and the others but you right. can't do that unless you take away how they're making their money you understand right. they don't abolish slavery now they, they said they're mm -hmm. abolishing slave the slave trade so they're interdicting these ships but that is mm -hmm. to knock the competition out of the game. And, right. and in the meantime, they take the African knowledge of how to make steel and become the premier steel makers in the world, right? And so the right. guy who founds Chase Bank, right, gets trained by the House of Rothschild, sent deliberately over to England because America was using um, the steel from Britain to build the railroads 
to bring the cotton to the market to feed the British cotton industry, textile industry. Mm -hmm. And so this this about and then so what they what they began to do in America was instead of even though they were still bringing us in on ships and beating the blockade, they began to breed us over here. Right. Instead of After 1807, because the U.S., March 2nd, 1807, the U.S. Congress passes a bill to abolish the international transatlantic slave trade, right. the U.S. involved. But not abolish that goes slavery. Into effect. No, I understand. I understand. Right. Trust me. I, I understand. That goes into effect January 1st, 1808. Yes. Okay. That's based upon Article 1, Section 9, Clause 1 of the U.S. Constitution right. that stipulated the earliest that the international transatlantic slave trade could be abolished was 1808. That means bringing Africans into this country to enslave them. So all the Africans, now here's the thing, they um, kept remember, doing that it. That is to knock out the, because America and Britain are right. partners in this. So they want yes. to knock out the competition, the French, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Brandenburgs, mm -hmm. the, the Dutch. And by cutting that off from them. Right. They, right, they, they're, they're cutting, cutting off the them. supply. Right, they're cutting mm -hmm. off the supply, and in right. in America, where they had a large enough piece of territory and a large enough black population, they could do go into the breeding process, and that's what they did. Right, and and what they did was it also increased the value of the African slaves that are already here because you're yeah. cutting off the supply right. as well. Now, now the other thing is they even though it was illegal after January first, 1808, they kept bringing Africans oh, in right until the 1860s. Right, up to right when the Clotilda comes in, right. So all the, the Africans, is the one we know about, right. That's the that's the last right. known slave ship we know about. Yeah, and and that was because of a bet. Timothy Mayer yeah. was the white wealthy businessman who made a bet that he can smuggle Africans into the country. But all with well, the point I want one of the points I want to make: all the Africans that were brought to this country from January first, eighteen oh eight through July of eighteen sixty, when the Clotilda comes in, all that was illegal based upon federal law. Right. Okay. So, to, so that helps to lay a legal foundation, not a moral foundation, mm -hmm. but a legal foundation for reparations because Europeans violated federal law. Also, there was a tax up to $10 paid for each African that was smuggled, that was brought to the country illegally as well. Mm -hmm. That's stipulated in the Constitution. OK, Article one, Section nine, Clause one. Now, um, and when and when we look at the uh, U.S. Supreme Court case of the Amistad, the United States versus the Amistad. Those Africans win their uh, freedom, Joseph St. Q and those uh, other Africans mm -hmm. on the Amistad slave ship, they win their freedom in the U.S. Supreme Court because the U.S. Supreme Court rules that it, uh, it was um, it violated international treaties for those Africans to be captured. Mm -hmm. It was illegal for them to be brought into the country because the international transatlantic slave trade was abolished right. and they were they were given their freedom. Right. OK, so this is why we got to get we have to understand history and law. Right. And, and, and so use this. The, Go ahead. From the very inception of the nation, slavery was, was legal. It was a part of mm -hmm. American law. America exactly. is completely culpable as a nation exactly. state. Yes. For the crimes against humanity committed against African peoples in the United States of America. Right. That's why they keep playing so many games. That's why I got right. to thank Sister Viola and thank her husband and thank our sister who was the director. Listen. Y'all just broke through a a, a a brick wall, okay? You knocked right. the whole wall down. You know, Black Panther did a good job in cracking that mm -hmm. wall, but you just yeah. knocked the wall down because what you showed about the homie, and people can scream all they want about they sold us into slavery. You need to get on the ship, you know, get on the plane, go to Africa. If you can mm -hmm. go anywhere else on vacation, I see some of y'all going to Paris. That's cool. We want to say, I've been to Paris. You know what I'm saying? I've been to London and so forth and Bristol and Liverpool and Leeds and Leicester and all of that stuff. But I've been to Africa. Mm -hmm. And I've listened to the elders. They still tell you the story of what they did. You can actually go to Benin. Go to Dahomey go to the very palace you see in the movie and sit there and the griots will tell you this history right if you really want to know it and wow. the white folks are trying to say all oh, this little group of black folks sold all these millions of please exactly <laughs> um, so let's tell the real story and let's put the whole picture 
Let's put Islam in there. I'm sorry to salam alaikum brothers. I was a salam alaikum brother too, I understand. But that's not mm -hmm. our religion. That was imposed right. on us just like Christianity. And many of the brothers, and to make it worse, many of the Arab Muslims were selling the black Muslims. There was actually a right. war in Africa between white Muslims and black Muslims. Mm -hmm. And that's how a lot of us got sold into the slave trade. And you will find that a large percentage of black Muslims were sold into the United States of America by the white Muslims. Not some indigenous right. African in Dahomey. Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah, because I know there was the, the you had the Indian Ocean slave trade with uh, the Portuguese and the, and the Arabs. You, but you, you had that, but you I'm had talking that. about there's a whole concept dealing with the jihads of the 1700s mm -hmm. and the 1800s with the raiding them once the Ottoman Turks yeah. crushed the Fatimite dynasty at the end of the ninth century and mm -hmm. takes over Islam worldwide, the Ottoman went to war against Africa. This is what destroys Ghana, the ancient Ghana kingdom and the Mali mm -hmm. and Sungai. It is the white Muslims declaring war on the black Muslims and selling us into right. slavery to the Portuguese and the Dutch. Right. We don't even talk right. about that because we have such sympathy for Malcolm X and the nation of Islam and Islam, but we need to talk about that. Yes, yes. that And because that deals with uh, like uh, El, Man, El Mansur of Morocco uh, invading uh, Songhai 1591. Mm -hmm. that, that right there. And one of the things that Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay talks about this in, in like the, the book of uh, Golden Age of the Moors, a fantastic book edited by Dr. Ivan mm -hmm. Serma. But Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay, who has an essay in that book, is, along with Renoko yeah. Rashid. And that's the beginning and, of it. The yeah. jihads of the 1800s and, and is where you really see the explosion okay. of this. Okay. Um, with, right. With coming down through Nigeria, Cameroon, Ghana. You know, mm -hmm. that's how the Ashanti gets involved in this thing because they're, right. they're, they're, they're fighting with the kingdoms of the Arabized, Islamized kingdoms in Northern Ghana encroaching on the hinterland of Ashanti. Okay. And the Ashanti is selling their prisoners of war. Right. Captured in that conflict. The same thing right. with the Mose people of what is now Burkina Faso. Mose being an indigenous population, but fighting with the Islamic encroaching on what became Upper Volta and later this, you see the same thing in Cote d'Ivoire with the right. Akan people of Cote d'Ivoire having an, another ethnic nation having to fight this Islamic horde coming from the north. And of course, a lot of them end up being black because they're being converted the same way we're being converted to Christianity. But this is the Turkish Ottoman Empire and the Eastern Arab empires. And we don't even discuss it. And you're not going to understand West African transatlantic slave trade unless you know about the Sahara and the Indian Ocean and the East African Islamic slave trade that comes right down into the Western Sudan. Right, because that goes great, back to about 8th century. Great, right, the great jihad. Yeah, the great jihad. Okay, uh, let me just show this quickly and we're going to wrap up. Um, uh, this right, I want to go back to this. I, I was able to find what I was looking for. So this is dealing with the uh, slave trade and the British economy. This is dealing with the Industrial Revolution. This talks about uh, this section talks specifically about cotton. OK, um, uh, from 1750 onwards, a new industry emerged in Britain, the production of cotton cloth. Wool production had previously been Britain's major industry, but cotton had one key advantage. Machinery is better than wool. And then 1793, you have the uh, cotton gin invented here in the U.S. And then you're going to have copies of the cotton gin which um, reduces the cost to producing uh, cotton. Uh, as a result, it was cotton production that the Industrial Revolution began. As a result, it was in cotton production that the Industrial Revolution began, particularly, particularly in and around Manchester, England. The cotton was uh, used, the cotton used was mostly imported from slave plantations. Slavery provided the raw material for industrial change and growth. So when we talk about this industrial revolution, the foundation of that was the cotton that African slaves grew. 
Absolutely. Uh, go, go, go ahead, Professor Small. Well, no, you just you just laid it out. And the thing that people mm-hmm. must understand is that the 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 American banking system was tied in to the British banking system, full partnership. Yes. J.P. Morgan Chase comes out of a tutelage by the House of Rothschild in London. Mm-hmm. Okay, and they were involved in selling the steel to America, right? To create the rail lines to move the cotton the cotton to the docks put on the ships to send to England, okay? All tied up, all wrapped up in one neat package. And so when right. they talk about they, they they were blockading Africa to stop the slave trade, yeah, they were trying right. to knock out their competition in the Industrial Revolution. Exactly, so let's exactly. Get, let's get it straight. Yep. Um, and everybody, you can, uh, this other article here, you can check out. I showed it on the screen briefly. I didn't give the... I didn't give the name of it. This is a, a really good article. This is from SmithsonianMag.com, so Smithsonian Institute. Uh, this deals with uh, the uh, real warriors behind the woman king, the real warriors behind the woman king, September 15, 2022. It goes through, it's about, I printed out all these articles I print out. I have thousands of articles printed out. Uh, so it goes through all this uh, history and, and it, it, it deals with uh, where the movie opens in uh, 1823 also. Okay, uh, yeah, because it talks about right here, uh, it opens in 1823 with a successful raid uh, by the Agoji who freed captives from uh the enslavement from the clutches of the oil empire and powerful Europa state. Okay. So it talk so it starts with the opening of the movie. Uh okay, Professor Small, look, we're gonna wrap up here. Uh once again, I know uh, you, you I, I've um taken one of your online classes you taught a few years ago. Mm. Uh and I think it was dealing with the Yoruba, uh, right. some of the, uh, right. the IFA, things like this. So uh give people your website address, let people know about how they can support you, DVD lectures, courses that you offer, things like that. Yeah, well, right now you can go to my website, uh professorjamesmall.com. Um and right. then uh my Facebook page, which is very popular, Professor Small African World dot com. Um Facebook is messing with me for some reason for the last few weeks, but I've been too busy to deal with them. With them. I don't know what I okay. said that got them upset. They're blocking all my, my pages and stuff. Um, but I'll get I'll get it soon when I get time to deal with them. Uh but you go to my website and then my my email is a m p o n s a three at gmail.com a m p o n s a the number three at gmail.com um i will be starting classes again starting at the beginning of 2023 i want to finish this 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 uh, godfather of harlem peace um which we should be finished at the end of october um, it should be coming out uh, the first week in January. It's better than the last two by a hundred miles. Mm-hmm. You're gonna love it, right? Because we, exactly. we got more courage. We got braver. You're gonna see a Nestor Che Guevara. You're gonna see a ne- Che Guevara and Malcolm. You're gonna see the CIA trying to kill both of them. You're gonna see the FBI plot Malcolm's assassination. I put it all out there. We're gonna. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> gonna- <laughs> and, <laughs> And, and you, as the historical consultant, you go through and you review the script. You let them know, okay, it didn't happen this way. This is not realistic. Things like that. That's 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 your job on the show. Because at the end of even, at the end of each show, when you watch the credits, your name is in the credits. Go ahead. Right. So I, I work with uh, some brothers, uh, Chris Bancato, who is the showrunner and the chief writer. I mean, beautiful mm-hmm. guy, and Michael and and and, and Paul, who is a brother out in California. We can solve them concepts, ideas, and principles. Like, how does this concept look? Like, right now, right. what are we doing? We're trying to figure out how do we do the assassination without replicating Spike Lee or replicating other movies about the assassination. I can't tell you what we're going to do, but it's going to be very right. unique. And we're not going to see. And my thing was, I don't want to see him getting shot. How do we right. handle that? Right. How, how the writers handle it is just beautiful, right? Um, but still tell the story as accurately as you can, right? Exactly. To keep the dignity of Sister Betty and the children and the family, you know. Um, um, 
showing Malcolm as a diplomat. We, have, we, we we've got him in Mecca. All right. Mm -hmm. We we've got him in Ghana giving a speech. To, and I mean, we got him in Cairo speaking. But all that's gonna be up in there. We got a meeting with right. Jay Guevara. You know, we 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 we've got a meeting with Kwame Nkrumah. So you're gonna see stuff that no one else has shown. Okay. And then we got right. the relationship between him and Bumpy Johnson, his friend, trying to keep him alive and trying to protect him. Then we bring the CIA mm -hmm. into play, uh, through the Cuban drug lords, right into Harlem. And then we get the FBI coming in wanting to stop Malcolm. But see, that gets hidden in other pieces. They talk about the nation right. of Islam, but they don't talk about these other forces. So we're going to deal with mm -hmm. the other forces big time out front. You know, uh, I, I, I deal with this uh, in my classes. Um, there's a good article, uh, and you just uh, you just hit on a little bit of this. There's a good article by Deneen L. Brown for um, the Washington Post. It deals with the day Dr. King met Malcolm X, March 26, 1964 at the U.S. Senate debate uh, for the Civil Rights Act. Martin Luther King Jr. met Malcolm X just once. The photo still still haunts us with what was lost. But what what the, well, what we, I want to hit on- We got him down in Selma. In the movie, we got him doing the speech yeah. in Selma. We got a meeting with yep. Andy Young. We got a meeting with Coretta. Mm -hmm. We're going to tell the story right. hard. Well, well, Malcolm gets in, what well, I was going to hit on, when Malcolm officially separates from the Nation of Islam, March 8th, 1964, Malcolm gets involved in the Civil Rights Movement. Right. OK. And that's and that and that's a part of Malcolm's life that's not talked about a lot. You got to do some research to understand this. You can't right. just quote excerpts of Malcolm's speeches. And Malcolm, the battle of the bullet that he first delivers that I know of March 29th, 1964 uh, in Washington Heights, New York. One of the things he's talking about in the in the speech is interjecting black nationalism into the civil rights movement. Right. OK. He, he actually uh, has a meeting in 65. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Ruby D's brothers, Tom's house in Queens. And mm -hmm. he meets with all of the civil rights leaders head. The only one that didn't make it was Dr. King, but Dr. Dr. King, said, right. he sent his rep. It's been a, all right, and Sarah, they agreed yeah. that they would work together. And Fanny Mahima, who was at that mm -hmm. meeting, invites him to come to Mississippi, a lecture mm -hmm. that would have taken place of two weeks after he was assassinated. Right, right. In the documentary, make it plain. They talk about that, but they said it was at Juanita Poitier's house. No, it was, in the docu it was Tom's house. Tom's house? Okay. Tom's house. And, and what was his relation to Ruby D? His brother. That's Ruby D's brother. Ru Ruby D's brother. Okay. Ozzie Davis's Ru wife and Ruby right. D. They were right. very close to Mount, that whole family. Right. So exactly. Elefante, of course. He was, you know, right. Both men were. Because they, they had this meeting. Uh, they had this meeting uh, with the civil major civil rights leaders and Malcolm, so they could put all their differences out on the table and work together. Mm -hmm. That's what the, that's basically yeah. what the meeting. And this was is about. what this is what forced Hoover to get more aggressive towards Malcolm's removal. Mm -hmm. Hoover, if you think he had an issue with Dr. King being on the side, now Malcolm and Dr. King talking about uniting. This guy's obviously gone crazy in D.C. at this time. Right. And he gave that's when he gave that order do something about him. Well, what the, you can't buy him, he won't take your money, you can't frighten him. What does do right. something about Malcolm X mean? Right. You know? Th this is what I was getting at. When when they met, uh they only met for a couple of minutes. When they met, mm -hmm. Malcolm told Dr. King, I'm throwing myself into the heart of the civil rights struggle. This is and this is what Malcolm was doing. And one of the things that Malcolm talked about in the Battle of the Bullet is uh, registering African-Americans in Harlem to vote as independents. Mm -hmm. And he's going through talking about the, the importance of understanding politics and getting involved politically. Uh, and then uh, June 28, 1964, when he delivers his speech um, announcing the formation of the organization Af of afro-american unity the, the speech that people call by any means necessary mm -hmm. he lays out this five point uh platform and he talks about voter registration in there he talks about economics mm -hmm. of course and education but he talks about pol uh, political engagement and voter registration as well and, and well, understanding well, remember, how to that was not new with malcolm because when he was still in the nation he was working trying to work with the freedom now party but the message just stopped mm -hmm. so right he, he, he right, exactly. Been trying to have and, that and, kind of engagement, but the nation wanted to remain mm -hmm. a religious organization and not a political organization. That was part of the well, you know, that got him separated from the nation. 
Exactly. And, you know, July 31st, uh, 1963, Malcolm sends a letter. Uh, he's in the Nation of Islam. He sends a letter to the leading civil rights organizers, including Dr. King. And he's requesting a meeting with them in in uh, that's going to take place in Harlem, New York. I think it was August of uh, 67, right around that time, August of 63. Uh, and, and he's calling Malcolm was calling for unification of the civil rights leaders and their followers. He, he said that we have to uh, find a common solution to a common problem posed by a common enemy. This is what Malcolm was doing while he's in the nation. He's calling for unification of the civil rights leaders and their followers. He's, he's, he's saying that we should be able to submerge our minor differences, the Negro leaders, submerge our minor differences to find a common solution to a common problem posed by a common enemy. And this is what we need to do today, brother. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and so when you read that, I wish you'd send me that article. I like to take it to the article. I'll send it to you. I've got thousands yeah. of articles, yeah. Professor yeah. Small. Yeah. Seriously, yeah. I'll send it to you. Right around those issues right now. Mm -hmm. And see, when you see that, then you understand why the split with the nation. You see the hand of Cointelpro. Right. Okay. Right. Cointelpro is well at work in the nation at this time. And the one thing they want to do is destroy the partnership between Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X. And they were able to yes. effectively do that in November 63. And once they got him yes. out, they went to work to make sure they could never get back together. And then as Malcolm right. slides, as he does, the move in partner with Dr. King, they killed him. And that just mm -hmm. Yep. It's Exactly, exactly. Well, look, brother, it's been fantastic. People have learned so much. Uh, everybody support uh, uh, Professor Jane Small, uh, support the uh, African History Network again. Here's his website, uh, uh, ProfessorJaneSmall.com, ProfessorJaneSmall.com. And then uh, his cash app also is dollar sign uh, Dr. James Small, DR, dollar sign Dr. James Small. Uh, and then uh, be sure to support the African History Network as well. Well, look, brother, it's been fantastic. Yeah. I know you got to run. Let's, I got. Let's, let's go ahead. Come back and call out uh, the woman king. That's why we came together, and people should go uh -huh. and go watch ahead. it. It's an extraordinary mm -hmm. document. Um, it's a good movie if you just want to be entertained with some really fantastic um, acting. But if you want to have your right. African melanin stimulated this will do it i guarantee absolutely you come away you'll come away blown away by this move you'll come away wanting to learn more yeah. about african right. history and who you right. are that's that's what that's what happened with malik that's so powerful i'm going to do my uh dna uh sometimes so i'm going to use african ancestry yeah i, uh, I did african DNA ancestry history. i haven't i did my mitochondria which is my grandma and that's 100 percent right there leon but I knew my great grandma mm -hmm. who came from West Africa. And I knew my great great okay. grandpa, my great papa great my great grandpa who came from East Africa uh, on my grandma's mm -hmm. side. Um, she was the root woman, the Yoruba priestess, you know, the dada and the plantation I grew right. up on. Um, so it's just so much of it is like wow. I mean, like I said, I don't cry in movies. These people had me crying. I mean, the tears. <laughs> right. Um, me too. I shared some my, tears at the my, end my too. It was was like I almost lost my breath a couple of times. And, and stunning <laughs> the way they did the essays and saw, um, uh, you know, the conflict resolution that they brought about uh, with the situation mm -hmm. that was clear, the problems, how they solved the problems. Um, let me explain to you what I'm saying. When, you, when you're making a movie, you create problems, you create contradictions. And the movie is about how right. do you bring resolution to the contradictions, right? They just do a fantastic job of it. You know? Exactly, exactly. And Miss, Miss Davis is just, when you see her, she is mm -hmm. the woman king. When you see her, she is the right. warrior general leader. No doubt about it. Naniska, yep, yep. And Naniska was a real a goji, yeah. but she wasn't a general. Yeah. So uh, I, I listened to the interview. I've listened to a number of interviews that uh, Gina Prince Bythewood, the uh, director, has done, uh, as well as Viola Davis. And Gina Prince Bythewood said that the character of, of Naniska was an amalgamation. Yeah. Well, that, it's a combination of most, different emotions. Most heroine and heroes, when you yes. deal with fiction, uh, 
fictionalized history, it is an amalgamation mm -hmm. of multiple characters. Um, right. And that's how you make it work. And it made it work because, like I said, this could have happened anywhere in Africa and it didn't happen in multiple places in Africa. And so right. exactly. if you want something to, and people are upset and saying, oh, this is fiction, then go study the history and tell me it. Tell me the story. Study the real history. Okay. Yep. That's why we're doing this yeah. show, that deal with the real history, because you w w what happens is movies that have a historical foundation, but a lot of fiction in them, it causes people to want to know more, more yes. about the real history. That's why I'm doing this show. That's why I contacted Professor Small. I, I, I contacted uh, Sylvian Dioff, who wrote it, who wrote Fighting the Slave Trade. I'm trying to get in touch mm -hmm. with her. I talked to Dr. Uh, Talitha LaFloria, who wrote... Um, who's the author of uh, this book here. We've had her on the show before. Uh, Chained in Silence, Black Women and Convict Labor in the New South, mm -hmm. Dr. T uh, uh, Talitha LaFloria. We, we've had I her here on the that. After History Network show before. Yeah, and uh, she, she had not seen the movie yet. She wants to see it. So I'm gonna try to get her on. We're gonna try to get some sister scholars on also as well. No, this, this, okay, this brother, look, go ahead. Good work, good work, good work uh, to the whole crew. Yeah. And what they've done is raise the bar in terms of mm -hmm. the kind of pieces that will now be presented to the black community about our history. Um, right. And if they don't give her the Academy Award, I'm gonna have to suit up and boot up and go out to Hollywood and handle it. She uh, deserves it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, uh, director uh, Gina Prince Bythewood, she credits the success of the film Black Panther <laughs> For opening the door, so for this movie to be funded, they, they, this has a fifty million dollar budget. Mm -hmm. She credits the film Black Panther because Black Panther did one point three billion worldwide, mm -hmm. number one movie for five weeks in a row. She credit, credits the success of that movie for being able to open the door for them to be able to do this mm -hmm. movie. Okay, so so that's powerful. Well, look, brother, I know you got to yes, run. Man. So thanks for taking your time out of your busy schedule, man. We'll talk soon, and and um, we'll, we'll talk about your classes. Okay, also, brother Michael. Okay? Thank you for inviting me. I always right, enjoy my time with you. Peace and blessings. Me too, brother. <laughs> All right. Hotel. Hotel. Peace. Peace, family. Okay, everybody. That was one of my teachers, Professor Jane Small, as well. Don't go away. We'll be here for a couple more minutes. Um, I teach online history class. Two things. Uh, teach online history classes and my radio show will be on tonight, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the African History Network show. We just did two, two hours, 15 minutes here. I got to do it. I have to get ready to do a two hour radio show. My main radio show, Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the African History Network show on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. Hotep, everybody. Hey, this is Michael. I'm Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. I hope you are enjoying this uh, broadcast that you're watching right now. I wanted to take a couple of minutes and let you know about the online history courses that I teach. So if you like this broadcast that you're watching, you definitely want to register for uh, the online history classes that I teach. Uh, we normally teach the classes on uh, Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Uh, our next class of uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade is going to take place on Thursday, November 17th, 2022, uh, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So if we look at a uh, brief overview of the class and the class is on sale, um, the, uh, the class is on sale $60, uh, regularly $130, okay? So we have the class uh, discounted right now. And if we look at a uh, brief overview of the class as well, uh, I've been teaching this class uh, since 2017, okay? And I put together the, the uh, curriculum uh, for the class. I've been studying history uh, 30 years. And we can't start uh, the study of our history in slavery even though understanding the transatlantic slave trade is very important, uh, we can't start in slavery. We have to deal with thousands of years of, of history that uh, lead up to the transatlantic slave trade uh, taking place. We look at the 800 year occupation of Europe by the African Africans known as the Moors as well to understand what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place, okay? So uh, a brief overview of the class we can't start studying our history uh, in slavery. 
uh, even when we study the transatlantic slave trade, which is important to study, we can't start in 1619 or in the or in the 1440s when the Portuguese get involved in the transatlantic slave trade. We have to understand the history chronologically and deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors who enter into the Iberian Peninsula today known as Spain and Portugal. Uh, today, uh, who who enter into the Iberian Peninsula today, known as Spain and Portugal, from North Africa in 711 A.D. This course not only deals with the transatlantic slave trade, but it also deals with thousands of years of history that leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. August 20th, uh, 2019, marked the 400th year anniversary of the 20 and odd Africans who came into Point Comfort uh, in Virginia, August 20th, 1619 on the White Lion pirate ship. Um, and this would later be the uh, colony of Virginia, okay? And when those uh, 20 and odd Africans came in, codified slave laws did not exist in any of the 13 colonies. Codified slave laws don't come to uh, Massachusetts until 1641. They don't come to the Virginia until about 1660 or 1661. Now, this year, uh, 2019, was known as the year of return. The year of return, as many African Americans uh, were reconnecting to Africa and traveling to Ghana and other West African countries. When we discuss the transatlantic slave trade, we have to first understand that African people are the original people of North, Central, and South America and have been in the land we call the United States of America at least 51,700 years. Okay, so we have the information on the homepage of our website, uh, africanwork.com, the African History Network.com. Uh, we also, uh, so you can register there for it, uh, for the class. And we have uh, a bundle pack we could, where you can register for both classes at a discount. So normally, uh, the classes are $130 each. They're on sale right now, uh, $60. So we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived. They're recorded. You can go back and watch them anytime. And uh, we're going to do at least 10 weeks uh, for these sessions. We may do 11 or 12 just to give us enough to get all the information in. So click, uh, click right here for register here. You can use a debit card or credit card. We have the bundle pack information here as well. Uh, the bundle is on sale, $100, uh, it's regularly $130. Click right here to register here for the bundle. And then the second class that I teach uh, on Tuesdays is from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1865 to 1968. That next class is going to be on Tuesday, November 22nd. Tuesday, November 22nd, okay? And this class picks up where... Um, Basically, we're understanding the transatlantic slave trade leads off. This is another 10-week uh, online class. And once again, we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch these classes a year from now, two years from now. You'll still have full access to the class. Okay, so um, with this course here, a brief overview, uh, in the aftermath of the insurrection uh, a year ago, the January 6, 2021 insurrection at the U.S. Capitol building, um, at the U.S. Capitol, many leading historians drew parallels between the violence that we saw that day and the Reconstruction era, which was 1865 to 1877. Uh, and this was the period of political revolution directly following the uh, U.S. Civil War, which was 1861 to 1865. This 10-week online course will analyze U.S. history primarily from the African-American perspective beginning in 1865 with uh, the uh, 40 acres and a mule special field order number 15. And actually we, we start in 1800 with the 1800 census. And we look at 1803 with the Louisiana purchase and the Haitian revolution. And we go and look at history uh, chronologically leading up to the civil war taking place. And then uh, we do at the end of the civil war, uh, uh, Juneteenth, June 19th, 1865, we did with special field order number 15, 40 acres and a mule, January, 1865. And then we look at the reconstruction era. And we go through and look at history chronologically through to uh, 1968. So we'll look at the reconstruction era, 1865, 1877, 
the red summer of um, the red summer of uh, 1919, the year after the Civil War ended. I'm just sorry, sorry, the year after World War One ended in 1918, the red summer where you had uh, over 25 major race rides across the country. Uh, we look at the Jim Crow era, uh, which is the period of time after Reconstruction ends. We go and look at the 1880s, 1890s, uh, 1900s. We look at the Jim Crow era and when the southern states are rewriting their state constitutions to impose poll taxes and literacy tests like um, the Mississippi State Convention of 1890. We look at World War One. The Great Migration, 1915 to 1970, six million African Americans migrate from the South up North and out West. World War II, uh, the Civil Rights Movement and the Black Power Movement. To understand uh, what happened to us after slavery ended, okay? What were the laws and policies put in place to put us uh, where we are today to understand where we need to go from here, okay? So the second class is uh, from the Civil War to the civil rights movement and black power 1865 to 1968 okay it's important to understand the chronology of history to get a better understanding of how we got to where we are now to understand where we need to go from here unfortunately uh uh some of this history is repeating itself okay so we have this available at our website as well the African History Network, uh, dot com. Normally the classes are on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. You can share this information with your children. I would say the information is PG-13. It's very visual. I, I do a PowerPoint presentation with book references, articles, video clips. Uh, usually for the book references, I'll show you the excerpts on the screen. So, uh, and we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. So as soon as you register for the classes, uh, there's content that you can start watching right now. Okay, so hopefully you learn a lot in these classes. Keep watching our, uh, our broadcast. Keep watching uh, this video that you're watching. And uh, follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P, and uh, uh, Michael M. Hotep on uh, Instagram as well. Remember, right now is correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win Wakanda forever. And we'll talk to you next time. Peace. Also, um, also listen to you can also listen to our uh, radio show. Um, you, you can also listen to our radio show on Sundays, uh, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the African History Network show. Uh, we have the information right on the home page of our website right at the top. OK, so uh, we have our social media information, social media handles and information about the radio show. And you can click right here to listen to audio podcasts of the radio show as well. Uh, we're on Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the African History Network show on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF uh, in Detroit. You can also download the iHeartRadio app and search for 9, 10 a.m. Uh, WFDF and listen live or the TuneIn radio app. And you can listen live there as well. OK. All right. Remember, right now is correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And uh, thanks for watching uh, our broadcast. Thanks for supporting us. Uh, also, if you want to support the African History Network, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, uh, and through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. The substance keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, uh, pay some of the bills. And we have our, uh, our Cash App information and social media. Uh, uh, our cash app information and PayPal information right on the homepage of our website also. Okay. So check that out as well. All right. Remember right now is correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win Wakanda forever. And we'll talk to you next time. Peace. Hello, African history network family. You've put it off for way too long. Now it's time to act for your family, your future, and the next generation. Get life insurance for that peace of mind and security for you and your loved ones. Build your financial foundations starting today. Your independent agent at Fortify Trust Life Brokers with over a dozen strong A-rated life insurance companies to offer you the life protection you need when it comes to final expense, term life, whole life, mortgage protection, annuities and more 
They are currently licensed in Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina. Don't let a pre-existing health condition hinder you from getting life insurance. You can get the affordable coverage you need today. Life insurance is only the beginning. Email them at Fortify Trust Life for a free fact sheet explaining the five basic building blocks for a strong financial foundation. It's their gift to you to help you fortify your future. Email them at FortifyTL828 at yahoo.com or call them at 706-339-5096 and leave a message. Fortify your future today.